Trade and Investment Minister Andrew Robb has been back and forth to China eight times in the past 13 months, all to get the free trade agreement nutted out and sealed before China's President Xi visited Australia last week. But it was only a few months ago that the deal was looking like it may not happen. Serious stumbling blocks threatened to derail the whole thing. Andrew Robb and his team of negotiators changed tack. But they were also helped along by China's willingness to move a long way on some areas. And a deal came through. While trade is the bread and butter issue of any government, it nonetheless should help Tony Abbott politically to have pulled this one off with its promise of better trade ties with the powerhouse of Asia. I spoke to Trade Minister Andrew Robb a little earlier. Andrew Robb, thanks very much for joining us. Now, it was only a couple of months ago that senior people in your area were indicating privately that the FTA with China was looking iffy at best on a number of areas that were real sticking points. What changed? What did you do to turn that around, to get this deal through? Well, uh, it is true. We, we were getting a little bit uh, apprehensive a couple of months ago. Um, the details were, were slow coming. But I do feel that uh, the big movement has been in services over the last couple of months and uh, it was after many attempts to, um, to encourage them to think of Australia as, uh, if you like, a special economic zone. It's a practice they have commonly done to trial all sorts of uh, new reforms. And I said we're not big enough to, uh, to swamp China and there's no need to concede things to other countries if they haven't worked after giving them to Australia. So I don't know whether that was a, a key factor, but it they did seem to have an impact on them. And I think they do realise they need services in a very big way if they are to, if they are to move their economy to a service-based economy and away from an agricultural industrial one. A service-based economy, of course, is one where there'll be many, many jobs and they've still got hundreds of millions of uh, farmers in rural China who will be moving to the cities over the, over the following few years. All right, I do want to talk about services in a minute, but I'm interested to hear you say that, in a sense, was that a kind of a secret weapon that you changed tack almost in the last few months, that you said to them, what, Australia's economy isn't big, it's not a great big competitor to China, think of us like these special economic zones. Well, that certainly was in regards to services, which I felt is very much a big part of our future. I mean, our economy is 80% services and we've got 15% of exports are services. So there's a big you know, disconnection there which we have to correct. And I do feel that you know, China and others in the region will be a big part of a, a very big transition in Australia. But secondly, uh, during that time, it became clear that China was also uh, very concerned to send, with this agreement, a very strong signal to the rest of the world that they were ready and willing and able to strike a, you know, a major decision, a major treaty, I'm sorry, with a major uh, developed country. And uh, I must say, I, I did remind them several times that if we didn't get a New Zealand equivalent on agriculture, um, I couldn't control the voices out there. And uh, no matter how good the deal was, it, it may have been badly received. So it was a combination of these sorts of uh, uh, prompts, I suppose, that um, certainly helped. But the, the bottom line is China did see that it was in their own interest to get a big agreement. And uh, we've been the beneficiary of that. Yeah, but I mean, it was amazing, really, wasn't it? That, uh, and I'm giving you an opportunity to blow your own trumpet, really, that you got in services, you did manage to get better access for Australian services companies, if they want to take advantage of it, than any other of China's trading partners. Yes, that's true, by a country mile, really. Um, you know, we can, once this agreement is finalised, and it usually takes about four or five months, uh, we will be able to have uh, owners of aged care facilities go in and set up one or a hundred if they wish in their own right, own, own hundred percent restaurants, own hundred percent hotels, own hundred percent, set up private hospitals and own hundred and hundred percent. I mean these sorts of services opportunities just have not existed before and 
it is quite exciting. Uh, as I say, I mean, I'd like to take, uh, you know, all the credit, but the bottom line is, one, we've got some wonderful negotiators, but two, timing and everything is life, is, is a big part of life, and mm. uh, the Chinese, I think, have come to realise that, you know, they've got to move on from, they've built lots of cities and infrastructure. The next stage for them, if they are to keep delivering for all of those expectations in China for high living standards, they have to move to a service-based economy and uh, Australia seemed like, a, I think in the end to them, um, a country that could offer a lot and they could learn a lot of lessons without taking too many risks. Yeah, a, a good test case. Now, um, on the other hand, there are a number of issues concerning some Australians, and we're not going to have time to go into all of them, but are you confident we won't have Chinese companies being able to sue Australia through the investor-state dispute mechanisms, for example, if they don't get their own way? Well, uh, there's a lot of hoo-ha about this uh, investor-state dispute settlement mechanism. We've had an, we've had a, an ISDS, as it's called, uh, for 28 years with China. But 28 have, years now, it, since it 1988. Become, you've, made it, you know, you've made it so that it can be that a foreign entity can now sue Australia. It's stronger, in a sense. No, but we've had the same... No, it's not. It's, 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 in fact, we have made it... Um, uh, we have made it safer for any public policy decision regarding health or regarding the environment. In the, the previous uh, ISDS, or the one that currently exists and has done for 28 years, uh, it's, it is as strong as any in the world. The sun has come up every day. There's never been one dispute between either countries. And in many respects, uh, the, the, bigger, the big beneficiaries of this ISDS are Australian companies because if they do invest in China, they want the, they want the certainty that if there's some discriminatory action taken against their company and not against local companies, that they've got recourse to this ISDS. Now, that's less likely to happen in Australia than it would do in China. All right, another issue that people are concerned about, how can you be sure that China is genuinely trying to stop corporate espionage and stealing of IP from Western companies? Well, all I know is, you know, the observation that I've had, and I've been there a great deal over the last 12 months. I've been uh, familiar with China for uh, some decades, but I've had a lot of exposure in the last 12 months. The move against corruption is, uh, is real. Um, it is widespread against, across the country, and you can, you can see in all sorts of uh, uh, different ways the impact of it already. And my conclusion, to be honest, Helen, is that if China is to, again, meet uh, the expectations of still hundreds of millions of Chinese who have yet to see the benefits of uh, the, the you know, the great growth there that some hundreds of millions are receiving, um, then China has to keep growing. And they realise if they don't, um, I think, get rid of the corruption, if they don't put in place a strong legal system that's known, if they don't do all of the sorts of governance things that um, developed economies do, they won't get the investment, uh, they won't get the trade, and uh, they won't get the growth. So it's in their own interest to start to, uh, you know, look and be like uh, any other major developed economy. Andrew, Rob, how are you going to possibly get an FTA up with India, which has been almost anti-trade um, externally? You sounded a little bit sceptical last week at the same time as Tony Abbott was saying, oh, yes, we can do it, that he and the Indian Prime Minister are the can-do Prime Ministers. They are much further behind in their trade outlook than China, for instance, aren't they? They are. That's certainly true. And, of course, our trading relationship is a lot further behind. We've got a two-way trade with China of $160 billion and I think it's about $15 billion with India. So uh, we've got to correct a lot of that and I think we can in the coming years. But on the free trade agreement, they have been very slow to move. That's been the experience not just with us but many other countries. But I was in the meeting uh, with Tony Abbott uh, in India, in fact, um, in New Delhi a couple of months ago when we went to uh, meet uh, Prime Minister Modi for the first time 
And there was a, a firm agreement rich, reached then at uh, Prime Minister Modi's instigation that we conclude something within 12 months. And he had his senior people beside him. They heard the instruction, if you like. They saw the agreement between the two Prime Ministers. And there is, that is a very fundamental and critical difference. The Prime Minister of India has got the first majority in 30 years, got an enormous track record from running one of the states, Gujarat, is the Prime Minister because of that, is, uh, is a man who's got invested in him unbelievable expectations from the Indian community. So I'll be leaning a lot on the commitment by Prime Minister Modi to get something done within 12 months. Andrew Rob, I know you've had your plate full with all this international trade work that you've been doing over the last little while, but I can't let you go without asking you the new configuration in the Senate. How much tougher will it be for the government with Jackie Lambie as an independent in the Senate? Uh, well, we've got to, you know, yet to see. We negotiate with whoever is there. One thing I can tell you for certain, and that is that it is, it is far, far better than the circumstance up until July 1, because in our first nine months of office, no bill of any consequence got through the Senate when the Greens and the Labor Party controlled that Senate. All right, but just how difficult will it be from now? Well, it, 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 it's never easy, but we have got something, we've got major initiatives through every parliamentary fortnight since July 1. It's not, Jackie Lambie has moved away, but in some ways, I'm told, she was holding up other members of PUP from supporting some programs that we were putting forward. So, right, you win, you know, there's swings and roundabouts things. in all this. We've got to... You've still got a few we major have, things we to have, get through. And, but if, if, if she was the reason that PUP was not supporting these major things over recent months, then chances are we've picked up two new votes on some of these issues. We've all lost, right, but perhaps you've okay, lost two. So. The one we've lost. Well, you never know. I mean, my view is that um, some of the other crossbenchers may be far more comfortable voting with the two existing members or remaining members of PUP than they were previously. So uh, we could well still find ourselves in a situation where we can get the six votes. It's not easy to get six out of eight, I understand that. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're. We've been pra quite practised. That's the way it always works in the Senate. And I do feel that uh, common sense will prevail over the longer haul. All right, Andrew, Rob, thanks so much for giving us your time. Thanks very much, Helen.